Welcome all of you to this live program of Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of all is Dr. Jacob O from Singapore. Dr. O is a senior consultant and deputy head at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Tantoxin Hospital, Singapore. He's also the chief of spine service at Tantoxin. Having graduated from New Zealand in 2003, he did his orthopedic residency in Singapore and later traveled to Canada for a fellowship in complex spine surgery. His current practice focuses exclusively on spine surgery with a special interest in adult spinal deformity, spinal navigation, robotics, and many invasive spine surgery. Dr. Jacob serves on the executive committee of the Singapore Spine Society, the Asian Mist, and is the current AO Spine Chairperson for Singapore. Dr. Jacob O has published in more than 50 peer reviewed journals and has won several awards for his contribution to clinical work and teaching. If you've noticed, Dr. O has delivered a lecture on a channel that's already reached a huge audience. And today is my great honor to bring back Dr. Jacob O for this wonderful live program. Over to Jacob. Yeah, thank you very much, Hitesh. It's again a privilege to be here at uh, Orthopedic Principles. Um, you know, your, 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 this program has been such a success. It's reached all the way down to my colleagues down here, my residents, and they talk about it. And I, again, I want to congratulate you for, for doing this, uh, such, a, such a pioneering work that you have uh, done for, for us, okay, for everybody community. So today, without further ado, I'll talk about MI's copectomies for TL fractures, thoracolumbar fractures. This will be a step-by-step -step approach. And I'll tell you that, um, you know, we see more patients with compression fractures because their osteoporosis is such a prevalent problem now. And I think for not just orthopedic surgeons, but a lot of spine surgeons, we're going to see and treat these um, fractures and a lot of them will require surgery at some stage. And I hope the MI's component will really help benefit the surgeons or gives us more option in our armamentarium to deal with these conditions. But let's start off by saying for most cases, I'm, I prefer to go posterior. Why? Because a lot of us grew up in the era of pedicle screws. And it's something that's familiar to us, predictable, and it's fast. Again, it's a workhorse for us. It allows for good decompression. And imagine if you're doing a case in the middle of the night, you want something that's fast, logistics are easy, and that's where we would like to go from the back. But sometimes we must or we have to go anterior. Take, for example, this L2 burst fracture. It's almost planar. There's no anterior column support. If you just did a short segment, a long segment from the back, you know it's going to fail. And so the benefits of anterior column support are very clear. Stability, great fusion rates. You can limit your contract maybe to one up, one down, or two up, two down. And you can also have a direct decompression. The indications have been really clear for these kind of cases. If you've got severe height loss by more than 50%, angulation by more than 30 degrees, or imagine if you had a patient with a very large retropulse fragment, how are you going to decompress the spinal canal from the back? Yes, you could argue that you could let the spinal cord float backwards, but to how much if the retropulse fragment is occupying about 70 to 80% of the canal, then you can only allow it to flow back to a certain degree. And that's where some surgeons will indicate, will suggest that you should go from the front to remove that fragment. And other recent classifications, such as the German classifications, suggest that uh, for OF, that's uh, osteoporotic fracture, the type 4 and 5, you should consider some form of anterior column support. But for those who are new to this um, approach going from the front, a few things that we need to consider in terms of the anatomy of the patient. First of all, um, let's start. There, there are four main areas, I would say, if you're going from the front. Let's start from the bottom first, right? If you're doing an L5 fracture and you want to do an L5 corpectomy, then you will consider an L5 direct anterior approach, similar to the A lift. Look at the picture on the left. What you can see is that you need to mobilize the um, iota and the IVC to uh, visualize L, the L5 vertebral body, and then you can perform your copectomy. The reason why you cannot go from the side is because of the eyelid crest. So that's why you need to do a direct anterior approach, very similar to the A-lift approach. Moving further up the lumbar spine, 
we talk about the L1 to L5 lateral approach, also known as the lateral retroperitoneal approach. And that's popularized by the O-lift, X-lift approach, right? Um, and this, we go through the, the picture on the left, you see the external oblique, internal oblique. These are the normal muscle layers that we're all very familiar with, okay? And then as you move higher up, you talk about the lateral retropleural approach. And you can see that at um, T11, for example, a T11 or T12 uh, fracture, notice that the diaphragm, okay, ends over us, starts over there, right? So everything below the diaphragm is retroperitoneal. Everything above the diaphragm, okay, is your, the, the lung. So you can see this is the part where you have to consider you're going, you cannot go retroperitoneal, it's retropleural or even transthoracic. And if you want to, and, and this picture on the left shows you the picture of, a, uh, of the diaphragm, you can see it's like an umbrella, right? Umbrella. And at L1 to L5, you can see very clearly you can go retroperitoneal. But at T11, T12, okay, then you got to go above the diaphragm, and then you're talking about into the thoracic, um, thoracic cavity. Anything above that, for example, in the mid-thoracic spine, you're talking about a right trans-thoracic approach, a right retropleural approach. And the reason for that is because the aorta is on the left side. All right? And, but a lot of us, for example, myself included, when it comes to, for example, a T6 or a T4 fracture that requires the anterior support, I like to go from the back because uh, the thoracic spine, you can actually easily cut the nerve roots. And so you can easily slip in a cage through a costal transversectomy. But if you talk about lumbar spine, you cannot sacrifice the nerves. So you've got to bypass the nerves and go from the front through one of these approaches. Of course, going from the front is not routine. And there's a reason why that is. And these are the disadvantages highlight, highlighted in the red box. Blood loss in acute fractures can be significant. Dura tears are almost really hard to repair, okay, because it's so deep. As spine surgeons, we're not very familiar with uh, abdominal pathology. What if you encounter a major bleed? How do you stop it? It's beyond your control. You need your colleagues to help you, and you do want to encounter that in the middle of the night. When you do an anterior procedure, usually you do a single, the most, or two-level copectomies. You don't, you can't do multiple levels. And of course, the morbidity of exposure is one of the major problems that we, the, of the major reasons why we wanted to move away from this. So if the anterior, if anterior reconstruction is really required, how do we avoid the morbidity of this approach? Can we do this all MIS? And that's the basis of my talk today. So I'm going to give you three case examples and going very, um, I'm going to put some videos and pictures to show how this is done step by step, like a surgical technique. So I've got this 65 year old lady who's got breast cancer, back pain and presented with back pain and neurogenic claudication and a foot drop. And she essentially had an L4 pathological fracture from METS. This is an MRI scan. You can see there's a significant collapse, severe cauda equina compression. And so she needs, definitely she needs a direct decompression. And so I chose to do this all MIS. You could do this from the back and do it open or percutaneous, but uh, uh, the anterior column is a concern for me. So I decided to do everything from the front. And this is what I did, I did L4 copectomy and posterior fixation. I'll break it down to four main steps, approach, copectomy, decompression, reconstruction, and the fixation. This is what the final outcome. And let's see how I did it. The approach is the retroperitoneal or the olive approach. You can see the patient is placed lateral on M school table. And I start with a true AP first. And you can see those wires along the L4 vertebral body. That's what we did for. We did an angioembolization before the surgery. Okay. And then I mark the levels of interest, like so. And that's the 
final incision that we're going to use. Um, it's a 5 cm oblique incision. You can see the vertebral body has collapsed so much that, um, and that our incision is going to be actually quite, quite small. And you can see, first of all, the external oblique fascia is seen and split. There's a transversalis fascia. And then you see the retroperitoneal fat. And then you see a psoas. This is exactly the same as the olive approach. Okay, then you dissect all the retroperitoneal fat away to expose the anterior border of the psoas, which is the oblique corridor. And I'll just show you the video how this is done. Again, the muscles are split. And you don't detach the muscles from its insertion, you just split them. Okay. And that's the retroperitoneal fat down there. And very <clears throat> easily, you just sweep everything anteriorly. You put your finger inside there to feel the try to feel the psoas muscle as well. And once you see the psoas, you're quite happy that your that's your lighthouse, as I say again. And then you just follow the psoas and dissect all the fat and the peritoneal contents away. And I tend to sweep a little bit more cranial and caudal because if I leave a small, just a small area, then I get more creep when I'm working. So I dissect all the attachments away first. Once that's done, I use this lip retractors. If I have a lip and I just hook the psoas back a little bit and I just feel for the, for the vertebral body or the disc space, usually the disc space is a little bit more prominent And that's our area of interest. I'll move on. And you can see the retractors are placed inside. And it's opened up. And you can see from the x-ray, the picture on the left shows me get putting the wire at the L45 disk space. Okay. And then when I open up the retractors, you can see the orange uh, arrow. Uh, when I've opened it up, you can see the orange arrow shows the blades, the, the, the cranial blades opens up and I encompass my area of interest, which is from the L3-4 disc space and the L4-5 disc space. So my L4 corpectomy can be easily performed. And that's how it looks like underneath the microscope. I actually don't use the microscope normally to, I just use loops when I'm doing this procedure, but in this case, okay, is for an illustration, I took the photo. And you can see the L3-4 disc is here, L4-5 disc, and then there's the pedicle behind. And then now we move on to the corpectomy. I always start off with the discectomies first. You know, you can argue, oh, I'll start off the bony work first, then it's faster. But once you do your bony work and corpectomy, there's gonna be a lot of bleeding. And I like doing the discectomies first because I, I really want to get a nice, good uh, fusion bed. So I work, I take out all the end plates, I get a nice level area, and then I worked on, work on my um, corpectomy. I use the corp to walk on the end plate. I break the contralateral annulus if necessary. I use the curettes, the pit rongers, exactly the same as your lateral procedures. And then you see two discectomies done, okay? And then now I use the osteotome for my corpectomy. Few reasons why I like to use the osteotome. <clears throat> because I can save bone. If it's a healthy bone, I'll use it for bone graft and also less bleeding as well instead of using the burr. This x-ray shows that I'm using the osteotome to go to the contralateral side. Now you don't need to go all the way um, to, the, uh, to the other end plate, just need to stop at the pedicle and that's good enough because your cage is going to sit at the medial wall of the contralateral uh, pedicle. Okay. 
And again, through this approach, I make sure that my uh, instruments are directly to the floor. It's almost like an orthogonal maneuver. So I don't go to anterior or posterior. If I go to posterior, I hit the tickle sac. If I go to anterior, I may hit a vessel. Okay, and that's how it looks like after the decompression. Sorry, and then uh, this is the video. <clears throat> For the copectomy, I mean. So this is after the discectomies are performed. I bring in the um, ostotome, okay. And under fluoroscopic guidance, so I'm safe. Okay, and then just by using the pituitary rongers, you can take out big chunks of this bone. Obviously, that this bone is not healthy and is used to um, send for histology for a biopsy. <clears throat> and once everything is done, you put a, some flow seal inside down there because you do not want any bleeding. And I put some gauze to keep the surgical field tidy. And then once that is done, I'll move on to my decompression. So it's pretty, the steps are pretty for straightforward, right? Approach, discectomy, scopectomy, and then now I'll do the decompression. Now it's important to, the benefit of an anterior approach is the decompression. So that in the back, at, when you're going from the back, the posterior side, you, all you need to do is put percutaneous screws. So that makes it a true MIS procedure. Okay, so first of all, how do you get to the canal? I identify the pedicle, and that's the anterior margin. That's the posterior margin. And as you can see, it's the pedicle. And once the decompression is complete, that's my kerosene, I can see that's the exiting nerve root. And that's the green arrow shows the remnant pedicle, which I'm biting off. Again, that's exiting nerve root. And that's the tico sac down here. All right, nicely de decompressed. And I'll show you this video. So the retractor has not moved since the start of the operation. Okay, it gets a little bit bloody here, but you can see in bone that's invaded by tumor is all just really soft. So I just take a curette and just peel it off just very gently. There's always quite a lot of bleeding sometimes, but this is easily controlled with some thrombin and flow seal and a bipolar, okay? So once you see the exiting nerve root, okay, because you've created a corpectomy, and this is the important step, right? Because you've created a corpectomy, what we do is we pull the retropulse fragment into the defect, right? So that makes it safe. You're pulling out everything that's hitting the canal away from the cord or away from the tickle sac, right? And it's why we always advocate for doing the corpectomy first and then the decompression. And so that's the final result. Everything is nice and nice and deep, uh, free. Finally, we reconstruct we can break the table to reduce the fracture, okay? So you can see there's a little bit of tilt on the picture on the left, but after we, uh, we jackknife the table or we break the table, you can see the end plates are level. Then we use the calipers to measure the size of the cage. And I like to use this expandable cage. You can go in small and then expand it to the, um, to the height that you want. And you could also can see that it's a bit of, um, that this cage gives the end plates give you a certain amount of lordosis that is required. And you can put it in small, okay? And then after that, you slowly align it, okay? And you jack it up. And you look at it from the AP and the lateral is satisfactory, you're happy. That's the final result. And then you go from the back and just drop in your screws. No decompression required, no stripping of the muscles. That's, so you can see the total blood loss is about 250 mils. It does usually take a little bit longer because you're doing a front and back procedure, but you know at the end of it, you know, it's, the patient's pretty happy and probably worth it.
at one year post so look at the fusion over here all right you can see um, that through that cage this expandable cage the bone has integrated not only in the at l3 but only also at l5 and so you know that you don't have to worry about this thing going to um, loosening pseudoarthrosis or even before it fuses whether you lose you, uh, there's loss of alignment so that's the first case. The second case is quite similar. Another L uh, L4 burst fracture. This lady over here. Um, you can see that uh, severe canal compromise. And in this case, it was a bit unique, right? We used the robot to do a single position surgery. See, that's the robot. Patient is placed lateral. Same thing, we use the uh, MIS retracting retractors. The discectomy is done, decompression is done. So it's very reproducible. And my resident likes it, gives, gives it a good thumbs up. And then this is the part, because, because the corpectomy cage uh, is so strong and gives has a good such a good footprint we can limit the length of our construct we don't you know general orthopedics normally say oh let's go long three up three down because the patient has osteoporotic bone let's put cement inside down there but the problem is this is different from a long bone the spine has many segments right so the issue is that if it's too stiff what happens it goes into pjk so that's why we like to limit the construct so because we are able to do perform anterior reconstruction then we can just, I just did a one up, one down. And using the robot, you can see what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the screen. I'm seeing my screws go in. These are the downside screws, single position, okay? And these are upside screws. And my resident is having a go as well, okay? And that's one up, one down construct with cement. And that's how it looks like, right? So I save her levels, okay? And, and this is the beauty about it, right? Post up day one, she's in the general ward and she's sitting up on day one. She's ambulating on day two, okay? Her leg pain is resolved. And look at this, look at her walking on day four, right? She's independent with steps. Now, you're not going to get this with a conventional anterior thoracolumbar approach open. You know, they are going to stay for a long time. And she's 76 years old, right? And you can see this is her at six weeks when I see her. The wound has healed up with just four step wounds. Okay, the little dot on the bottom, that's the that's for the robot, that's the percutaneous pin. But she's walking around, she's thinking of doing her housework. And I say, no, you hang on for a while. But this shows the, the beauty about the millimeter basic approach um, that, that everybody can do. And it's not it's not difficult, right? And finally, we talk about the lumbar spine. I'm going to show you a case. That's a bit different that this is T12, another very common scenario, right? A T12, you can see it's planar. What do you do for this lady? Okay. She's 88, but she's a good 88. Now imagine this was a 70-year-old lady, right? You're gonna, you have, you can't ignore it because look at the MRI scan. There's cord compression, there's cord signal changes. She's myeloptic, right? She can't really walk steady. So a T12 burst, unstable. We need to address a few things: the kyphotic deformity. We need to decompress and we need stable fixation. So how will you manage this? I know there are many ways, two up, two down, put some cement inside down there. But if you want to do a minimally invasive approach, it's now possible because we have the right instruments for that. And this is what I did. I did an MIS T12 copectomy, a T10 to L2 stabilization, okay, with a direct decompression. So at this area, remember I say it's different. It's a retro plural approach. Pro approach. So I see the T10 rib. Again, if you see a T12, usually the rib that you see, if a T12 vertebral body fracture, usually you're taking out two ribs above the fracture level. So T10. Okay. Once I take out T10, I see the pleural underneath there. And this is what you see. You can go trans thoracic, but usually you can see the lung is beneath there. And you can see the um, it's moving up and down, but usually we try to go retroperitoneal so that you don't enter the thoracic cavity, less risk of uh, lung problems. So just peel that layer down, okay? So that's why I say 
And then slowly you work your way to right down to the spine. You can see we're slowly working our way forward. That's the spine down there, right? And you can see on your bottom right, a little bit of that psoas muscle creeping in here. Okay. And same thing, steps are the same. Once you get down to the spine, you do the decompression, discectomies, decompression, and put a cage in. Very straightforward, right? Reproducible. So that's how it looks like. T11, 12, T12, L1, the burst fracture is there. After the copectomy, we put a cage. That's how it looks like. And day one, I got her to stand up. That's pretty good, right? And then, and then look at the decompression. She had a little bit of numbness after that. So and then so I just decided to get an MRI scan. Look at the decompression compared to what she, there was before. And again, the fusion is it's astounding when you think about uh, these copectomy cases. So to to finish off, I'll just say the posterior approach is great. It remains the workhorse for most of our cases. But for certain cases, really anterior column support may be necessary. And because we can now do this using an MRI's approach, so much of that mobility is gone. We can have all the advantages without the mobility, and we can offer this to so many for, to our elderly patients uh, and get them up and about much faster. And again, it improves the surgeon's armamentarium in managing all our fractures. So with that, um, I thank you very much for your attention and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Jacob, you, you can stop sharing. Uh, thank you, Jacob, for this brilliant presentation and congratulations for the excellent work that you do at Nantoxin. Thank you. Thank you, Dash. Uh, Jacob, uh, let's have a short Q&A. Jib, what bone graft substitute do you add into these cages? Is it demineralized bone matrix or what is it that you add for osteogenesis? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, when you have, um, most of the time I take their own bone, right? Because you get a copectomy, so you can add quite a lot of bone. But if it's tumor cases, well, you just put some DBM inside down there. And that's what most of the time what I use. Now, even though you don't have so much bone, it's okay because... What happens is the contralateral side you haven't touched. So the contralateral side will tend to fuse as well. So a combination of factors, the back is quite stable because you haven't caused much destruction to the, to the mus musculature of the back. And in between the cage, you put DBM, it fuses, and, and, and the sides also fuses because of its natural healing potential. So yeah. Thank you, Jake. And what is the situation with the uh, bone morphogenic protein? At one point of time, we talk a lot about uh, RHBMP7, and then there are a lot of issues, especially in the lower lumbar area. So is this still available or have you used it in the past? No, 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 it's still available. I think uh, a lot of that, um, well, it really started in the Spine Journal by one of the editors. Uh, more, 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 more Eugene exactly. Karagi. Eugene that's Karagi. right, that's right. Eugene Karagi. You're a spine guy, I can tell, right? <laughs> And then the biggest buzzword was whether this was uh, where cancer was involved, you know, and everybody started getting a bit worried. But I think there are many studies now to say that um, it is not really, there's no really a direct correlation with the cancer, right? And many people are still using it. And I think a lot of complications such as um, uh, too much bone formation, radiculitis is usually related to the dose as well. So now uh, a lot of times we use less amount of BMP, don't overdose. And we are we're careful, we don't use it in the cervical spine because it causes seroma. Now, the reason why I think these uh, substitutes are still important because MIS cases, you can't take so much bone, right? Unlike open cases where you can, you got so much bone to use. But if you want to be an MI surgeon, sometimes you may have to use uh, BMP and it has helped, been helpful. But you're right, the issue is sometimes with the cost. Um, but we do counsel the patients with all these, all these risks involved. Right? Thank you, Jacob. And Jake, you've shown uh, examples where you've used fluoroscopy as well as robotic. Now, do you think robotic has a significant advantage, especially when you look at radiation exposure to your staff, your colleagues? I mean, do you think that's an advantage? And is there any disadvantage with the robotic? I'll tell you, robot, um, at this point of time, I think robot technology is um, still, still new, right? But robots, um, I, I would say that the radiation is maybe slightly it's similar because for a very experienced surgeon using the freehand technique they'll say hey i don't need to take any any x-rays at all right and say i need two x-rays for robot you still need to do some registration the merging of the pre-op ct 
and uh, and and sometimes verifying your 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 construct. I would say the more biggest benefit for robot is the planning. So because you get your CT before the end of software, so you can plan your screws to the largest diameter, the longest diameter, and not just that, you can plan the entire construct from, for example, L2 to pelvis. So your screws are going to line up exactly what you plan it to be, right? And so that's the best part of the robot. And there are many things to do. It, it can put screws at very odd angles, for example, single position surgery, ILEX screws, difficult small pedicle screws. I think it's, it's very promising what's out there, but it's very costly, right? So, so you think uh, the radiation exposure is significant even when you use a robot? Yes, it is. It is because um, you, you, still need, you still need to check your screws at the end of it, right? You still need to merge that, that data. You need, still need to do a CT scan. The patient still needs to do a CT scan pre-op. So there, the patient is going through some radiation. But maybe to staff, well, at this point of time, I still use um, the, 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 quite a lot of fluoro to check the screws as well. So, but maybe in the future, less, we'll see. Thank you, Jake. And Jake, how often do you get uh, neurological deficits in osteoporotic vertebral fractures? Because we see all these fractures very commonly and very rarely do we get deficits, right? So like, what is the percent they say, less than 5% or 10 or how is it? Well, yeah, I think a lot of them you see in the outpatient clinics, you see the compression fracture is so bad, so collapsed, so patient has not much pain, right? Or even they've got a lot, so a lot of pain and MRI scan shows there's canal compromise. I would say less than 10%. Yeah, not everybody gets uh, symptomatic from it. And once it fuses, the canal remodels and they are, they are okay. They're okay. A lot of times, sometimes they may complain of some thigh pain, some thigh ache, right? But it doesn't mean, I, I don't always rush in to do surgery on these patients because they, they um, a lot of them, Surgery has its risk, especially in these osteoporotic patients. Sometimes you see their BMD scans is minus, score is minus 3.5, right? So uh, it really depends on how significant their neurology and how significant their pain is, then I'll tend to intervene. Yeah. And what would be your optimal time? So would you wait for some time for recovery, partial recovery, and then intervene? And how, uh, how do you plan? Approximately what, what time? Yeah, when the patient comes to me, like most of these patients, normally... Uh, the first time when they're in acute pain, I take an x-ray, I take a standing x-ray. If the, if the collapse is not so bad, I just send them home first and, and see them back in about two weeks' time. And when I see them back, if they're still very symptomatic and the x-ray collapses more, then I'll be concerned. So, um, so the, the, the short answer is that when the second review, I look at how bad the fracture has collapsed and how symptomatic they are. And this, that's, that's one group. Of course, the ones that are very severe and the initial presentation, if they've got neurology, and that's a different case. But I think we're talking about those who have like common garden compression fractures. How do we manage these patients? Most of the time, they do okay. But if serial x-ray shows they, they compress more, they become more planar, they become more kyphosis and they're symptomatic, then I tend to intervene. Not more, not too late, not, not too early as well. Right. Thank you, Jake. Jake, one last question before I end up the session. Jake, what is the role of a vertebroplasty or a balloon augmentation uh, I mean, using cement? Do you do you still have it in your armamentorium to treat these fractures? Yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> I I feel that it's a it's a very good procedure sometimes for those patients who are in a lot of pain, right, and really can't get up. I don't do it straight up because uh, let's say a patient comes in with a compression fracture. I don't inject them within the first one week. Most of the times, most surgeons will wait for a while. If the patient is uh, improving and they're mobilizing, we just let to leave them alone. But more importantly, treat the osteoporosis. However, if they're bed bound for three weeks, then I'll just uh, I'll offer them the procedure. There are many types, vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty, stentoplasty. You pick your choice. I think they're more or less the same, but just be careful of the burst fractures. You do not want the cement to leak out of that and cause problems. Yeah, but yes, Sean says yes is still helpful. Thank you, Jake. Uh, Jake, I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for yet another brilliant presentation. And I'm sure this is going to be benefit a lot more people, more than Singapore, more than Malaysia, it's all over the world. Thank you, Hitesh. So good to see you. And uh, congrats, 